in the book of Revelation, the final book of the Bible, it says that the redeemed will sing in heaven and there's a beautiful image of people from every tribe, every nation, every people group uh, on the face of the earth that are worshipping Christ. And I was just sitting there saying to Kath, have a look up there. Out of nine people, seven have got parents that were born overseas or that are from different nationalities, including uh, beautiful indigenous people as well. So isn't that a wonderful image of the church of Jesus Christ? And Ben, you've done a fantastic job. Put your hands together for them, hey? The resurrection of Jesus Christ occurred 1900 and how many years ago now? 70 years ago. And I want to share some, some thoughts about the resurrection because it's such a positive, hope-filled and faith-igniting event. It's filled with great joy and is such a contrast to the terrible grief that everyone was experiencing because of the dark events of Good Friday. And for Jesus' disciples, it was a bad Friday. They couldn't see anything good in that day. And only after the resurrection could they see how God was using Jesus' death on the cross to display his goodness. They'd, they'd been aware of his goodness, but they now could see God's goodness and a new light, like the lights were turned on. The prism of the cross revealed the goodness of God's heart and the love of God's heart that they would never, ever forget. God's love for people, God's love for the world, such an amazing love that he was prepared to allow his son, the Prince of Heaven, to die in the place of sinful humanity so that we could be reconciled back to him and be saved and, and the barrier of sin that separated us from, from God and perfection could be removed and that we could come into his presence without fear and guilt and shame and be accepted by him. Amazing. The disciples and the women, and particularly the women embalmers, they came on the Sunday morning. They were not expecting him to be alive. And so they came with all their spices and, and they were going to mummify the body of Jesus. And so they'd already started the mummification process. And so there were strips of linen and uh, spices and uh, the first level all over him and uh, head to toe. So they were going to do a second lot, which is a practice in, in the Middle East. And so um, they were just not expecting it. Look at what Mark says, the scripture, Mark 16, 1 to 4. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. <laughs> Mary thought someone had stolen Jesus' body. She really thought that. And so she starts wailing because it's a double grief to her. He's been killed on Good Friday and now somebody's stolen the body and she just could not believe it. And so she's full of despair and, and, and confusion. But then Peter and John, they come running towards the empty tomb because they went back, the women went back and said, they've, they've stolen the body, they, we don't know where he's gone. And, um, and so uh, Peter and John came to the empty tomb and they looked in and all of a sudden they were convinced that he was alive and that in fact his body was not stolen. What did they see? They saw the linen strips and the burial cloth. Have a read of this, John 20. He, John, stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. Well, the cloth that had, been, that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. I love this. And he saw and he believed. What did he see 
that forced him to believe when they were thoroughly confused about Jesus dying on the cross. They didn't understand what Jesus, Jesus had started telling them nine months or so before his death. He's teaching them, he's training them, and then towards the end, he starts sharing with them, guys, my purpose is I've got to die on a cross. I've got to die for the sins of humanity. But don't worry, I'm going to rise again. So he's talking to them, he's telling them, but they don't comprehend. They just cannot imagine life without Jesus. And so like Mary, they're in fear and they're in confusion. They run away from the, the, the death scene of Jesus. Only John was there. They think they're, they're next, they're going to be killed. And so Mary goes, with the women go with spices to anoint the dead body. They're not expecting him to be alive. And Peter and John run in there and it says that he saw and he believed. Well, when I was nine years old, there was a very good Anglican minister. His name was the Reverend Tom Drought from St. Richard's Anglican Church just on Henley Beach Road. And he would do the religious instruction in school, Lockley School. And so my mum, being, being brought up Greek Orthodox, uh, there was no Greek priest to teach us RI. And so back in those days, we had religious instruction. And so she said, well, you can't go to that one, you can't go to that one, you can't go to the Catholics, you can't go to the Baptists, you can't... Go to the Anglicans, they're most like Greek Orthodox. They're almost got the truth. So uh, anyway, so I went and uh, the Reverend Tom Drought and, and he told me the story. He told the kids the story. And he said, when Peter and John looked in and they saw the linen strips had been taken off the body of Jesus and what was covering his head was neatly folded, they were convinced that Jesus rose from the dead because there was a Roman guard guarding the tomb because there was a rumour that perhaps the disciples would come and take the body. So they actually secured the tomb. And if you read the Gospels, the, the guards went to sleep and uh, were shocked and, and angels came and opened the tomb and, uh, and Jesus, of course, walked out. But the fact that Jesus took the time to take off all the linen bits, put them in a pile, took the headscarf and put it down there. If somebody was going to beat up the Roman soldiers and steal the body, they're not going to take the linen strips off another 15 minutes to half an hour because it was all gooey and yucky and stuff. They wouldn't do that. That's one of the great reasons why historians, when they look in, look into the evidence that demands a verdict, say... That just doesn't make sense. And so they looked in and believed and realized Jesus rose from the dead. And uh, so I, as a little boy, never forgot that story. So even though I went wild in my teenage years and didn't come to personal faith in Jesus till I was 17 and was really into sin, I mean, I was really into living selfishly, self-centeredly, abusing people, my parents and others, and, and just living a terrible lifestyle, really, as a kid, as a wild boy of the 60s and 70s. And, and yet that seed was sown in my heart and mind. And when I started hearing the gospel at a youth group when I was 17, I remembered Tom Drought's story. I remembered a couple of other stories as well. You see, the empty tomb and the appearances of Jesus is proof positive that the Christmas and Easter stories are absolutely true. The incarnation, he visits the planet, he comes as a babe. The atonement, the substitutionary death sacrifice on behalf of humanity dying in our place is absolutely true. And they challenge us to either respond to him and say, you are Lord, I, I, I'm looking and I believe and I receive or to reject him. There can be no neutrality here. That's why people either, you can't just say, oh, well, if it's true for you, then it's either true or it's not true. You can't be neutral here. Either he is the son of God and he died on a cross for our sins and, and there's positive proof that he rose again, as I'm sharing with you. Or you say, well, look, I'm just going to, reject this and, and pretend that 
it didn't actually happen. And that's why uh, Jesus is such a challenging person. We're not talking about being religious or being part of a church community as such. We're talking about the person of Jesus Christ. I was just watching a, a program last night with Kathy on Billy Graham as he's being interviewed by a really strong guy, uh, William Buckley Jr., and uh, interrogating him with a bunch of students in the late 60s. And, um, and, and the way that they are arguing with him and, and, and what Billy actually presents is so beautiful and, and shares that there can be no neutrality with Christ. You can have an argument with the church, you can have an argument with religious people, but when you cut to the chase and you read the four Gospels and you think about Jesus, he is the most challenging person in the whole world. Even though some of his followers may not be practicing or they say they're Christians, but they're not living the Christian life. And that's what Billy Graham was saying. He goes, well, don't judge people by saying... A person can say they're a Buddhist, they can say they're, they're, they're a Muslim, but if they're not living according to their precepts, then it's not true. And it goes the same with some Christian people. It goes, a Christian is a person who loves Jesus, is a follower of Jesus, and wants to live for him and allows Jesus to be at the centre of their life. And so uh, uh, there can be no neutrality. The empty tomb and the actual appearances of Jesus is proof positive. Jesus appears to his disciples and to Thomas, who was, of course, the, the great sceptic, the one who had all the questions. And do uh, you know what? He's been appearing to hundreds of millions of people ever since. He appeared to me as a 17-year-old. You say, are you crazy, Bill? No, I'm not crazy. Did I see him physically? No, I didn't see him physically. But his appearance was more real than if he was physically here. His presence, his word, as I started reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as I started hearing stories from people that had been talking to him, as, as I watched people praying and talking to him, as I saw answers to prayer, I felt great sense of God's presence. And there's no question in my mind that it was, it was I wasn't looking for him. He was looking for me. And my eyes were opened and I could, I could understand the cross. I could see God's love showing itself, manifesting itself, dying for somebody who didn't deserve salvation. And his presence became so real to me. He appeared to me spiritually through the Holy Spirit. And, and, and most of us here who know Jesus Christ, we can say the same thing. I know him because he's appeared to me. I have a relationship with him. I talk with him. He talks with me. No, it's not a matter of hearing voices and being strange out there, but, the, but he speaks through the Holy Spirit whom he gives to us. He speaks through his word that becomes enlightened. As we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the letters of the New Testament, as we read it, he speaks to us. The testimonies that we had on, on Friday morning, Yen Daly, who led us in songs this morning, and Peter and Karen Crouch, and uh, I almost wept when I, when I heard them because I know their stories. And Yen is a newer Christian. She's uh, been in, in the things of, of Christ for maybe five or six years. And uh, amazing young woman. But her story, if you get a chance to, to see it, is it going to be on YouTube? You've got to ask permission, do we? Oh, it is going to be. Uh, we just asked permission. Yep, it's going on. Yep, you've got to see it. And Peter and Karen Crouch, if they're here, I, I, I saw them coming to Christ 30 years ago. And each of them say they, they felt like Jesus was, was not just giving them a gentle shove. They almost like they could not resist his love. They could not resist his offer of salvation. And, and people find themselves lifting their hands up to receive Christ, running out the front when there's an altar call. And they say, it's almost like somebody pushed me out there. No, 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 no one pushes anyone. It's a free decision. But it's like the will yielding to the Holy Spirit who lovingly draws us to him. And their stories are fantastic stories. And if we get Peter and Karen's permission, we'll put that on YouTube as well. What's the, what's the site called, CFC? Familycenter.tv. Familycenter.tv. Watch it. Great stories. Don't believe what I say. Re listen to what they say, Yen and Peter and Karen. Hey, this marvellous passage from John's Gospel tells me what Jesus wants to do for all of us. 
And on this Easter Sunday morning, I can confidently say, I know what Jesus wants to do for you. The scripture tells us, Jesus wants to speak peace into your life. In John 20 verse 19, it says that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jews, the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them, the resurrected Christ. And you know what he says? Peace be with you. And for some of you here today, you're in turmoil. You're confused. You have self-doubts. There's a lot of issues in your life. When Jesus comes into your midst and into your life, he will speak peace to you, reconciling peace with God the Father, restorative peace in ourselves to calm our nerves and to bring tranquility, and relational peace between people if there are difficulties that you might have with others. He speaks peace to you. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the peacemaker. Secondly, Jesus wants to reveal himself to you as the crucified one. Each person's got to have a revelation of this. Not that he just died on the cross for the sins of the world. is that he died for my sins. It should have been me hanging on that cross. But Jesus took my place. He is God's precious son sent to earth to become the saviour of the world and our personal saviour. Have a look at this at verse 20. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, the great gash that split his side open and pierced his lungs and, and heart and blood and water flowed out. The great gashes in his wrists, his hands. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. You know, the source of peace, the peace that Jesus speaks to you, the source of it is the cross. There can be no peace with God. There can be no internal peace. There can be no, no, no peace between people unless we come by way of the cross and we see his wounds and we see the gash on his side and realize he did it for me. He died in my place. Jesus cannot forget us. We have been graven on the palms of his hands. Forever he will have these scars, reminding us of the price paid to save us. Whenever we look at him, for those of us, those who are in heaven have gone before us, when we actually see him and gaze him, we will be forever grateful because we'll see those gashes. Thirdly, Jesus wants to commission you as he saves you. You see, he saves you for a purpose. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. He saves you and then sends you. To whom? To your world, to your parents, to your uncles, to your aunties, to your neighbours, to your extended family, to your work associates, to your schoolmates, to your university friends. Because everyone needs to hear this good news, not just on Resurrection Sunday, Easter. He saves us for a purpose. This ain't a private faith. Oh, you know, religion is just between a person and God and no one should know. Fooey! Christianity is a public faith. If you come to know Jesus Christ and he saves you, he immediately commissions you to say, now go and tell them what I've done for you. As he said to the demoniac in Gadara, you read it in Mark chapter 5, the man who was delivered of awful evil spirits and mental illness and, and other terrible issues in his life he said to the man he said now that you're healed he goes you go and tell them go and tell your family go and tell your friends how what God has done for you and how he has had mercy upon you because the guy wanted to follow Jesus I want to be the 11 I want to be the 13th disciple and Jesus says, no 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 you go back and tell them because you you tell those people in Gadara they're not Jewish people These were foreigners that were living in that area near the Sea of Galilee. Because you go back and tell them. Tell them how good God has been to you and how he has had shown mercy to you. So we are commissioned. Jesus wants to commission you as he saves you so that you will be a witness. And then he wants to empower you 
to be able to share his message of forgiveness and love. In John 20, it says, then he breathed on them. I love this. Imagine Jesus just breathing. So he comes and he speaks peace. Peace be to you. Shows him his hands. Peace comes through the cross. Peace again. Now I'm sending you. Then he says, now I'm going to breathe on you. And he breathed upon them. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. He's basically saying, you are my emissary. You're my ambassador. As you go and tell them, that's how they will find forgiveness of sins. That, and, and you can't forgive their sins. Only I can. But you've got to tell them how their sins can be forgiven as they turn to me. He gives us his presence and power through the Holy Spirit to enable us to share the good news about Jesus. And a genuine Christ follower, a genuine Christ follower cannot shut up. They've got to talk. They've got to say it. How can you not? You, you, you've, you've found the most, you found the answer to life. You found the answer to life. You've got the gift of eternal life. You're going to live forever. You want to take as many people with you to heaven. Heaven is real. Hell is real. There will be a judgment. And God doesn't want to send anyone to hell. He wants them all to go to heaven. And the only way we can get to heaven is through Jesus Christ and his cross. And those who reject him, those who reject him, not those who don't know who have never heard, those who reject him and then commit themselves to doing evil against precious people, they're destined for hell. Evil doers who deliberately choose to hurt other human beings and who willingly reject the offer of forgiveness and grace from Jesus. And we have a justice system in our world. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But folks, there will be a day when perfect justice will be manifested through Jesus Christ when he returns and wraps everything up. And I'm so glad that my sins, my past sins are not going to be, they're not recorded and they're not listed on the book. It's, the slate is clean. Not because of my worth, but because Jesus died on the cross and his blood extinguished the record so that God no longer looks upon me as a sinner, but as a saint, as one that's set apart, as an adopted child of God. Not because of anything I have done or you have done, but because of what he has done for us. And I tell you, I look forward to the day when I can get to heaven. I'm not racing to get there because we have a great sense of permanency here and we love life here, but there's no fear in death. No one likes the process of dying. I'm not saying I like that. No one likes that. But there's no fear because we know where we're going. And you've got to know where you're going. And this Easter, if God is speaking to you and saying, you know what, if you don't have an assurance that you don't, you don't know where you're going, don't leave today without opening your heart and saying, Jesus, come into my life. Give me that assurance that my sins are forgiven, that I have peace with you, that your Holy Spirit come, will come into my life, and that the gift of eternal life, the moment the Holy Spirit comes within, you've got the gift of eternal life and power to be able to live the kind of life that he wants you to live in the here and now, to overcome the obstacles and difficulties that life has. And life can offer us some terribly curved balls. And really bad things can happen to even really good people. That's life. Life is wonderful, but it's also a stinker. Things can happen that are really difficult. And we just can't cope unless we, we know who the author of life is, Jesus. And we know that we're safe and secure in his arms no matter what comes our way. No matter what may happen, that we're safe and secure in the knowledge of his love for us and his salvation is secured through his life and death and resurrection on our behalf. The final scripture says this, the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs, in addition to the ones recorded in this book. This is the Gospel of John. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, putting your trust in him, the Greek word believing is pistevo, it's a doing word, it's a verb, it's actually saying putting your trust, relying on 
upon him, sticking to him like glue, two pieces of, of wood being stuck together by a glue that can't separate them. It's not just believing with your head, it's believing with your heart and will. So that by putting your trust in him, believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Wow. I'd like to lead you in a prayer before we sing some songs. And I have a great sense that God, through the Holy Spirit, is touching hearts. He's touching you. He's drawing you. This is not coincidental that you're here at church on a Sunday morning, Easter Sunday. You're not here because you hate God. You're here because you have a respect for God. You're here because someone's invited you and you're not anti, but you're open. But maybe you've got some religion and you know about Jesus, but now you're finding out about how to get to know him and experience him. He loves you and he's revealed his love for you by dying on a cross and rising again. And he in heaven now has sent the Holy Spirit to empower us to be able to tell you the truth about Jesus. And I know that there are many of you here today that need to open your hearts to him. And I want to lead you in a prayer. I want to lead you in a prayer where you can receive Jesus. And for those of us who know him, let's be praying for those who don't know him. And then we're going to sing some songs where we say, thank you, Jesus, for who you are and what you've done. So let's close our eyes as I lead you in a prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your wonderful word, this passage in, in Mark 16 and in John chapter 20, the resurrection story. Thank you that you speak to us through your word today. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here among us through the Holy Spirit. I thank you that people have heard your word and something has stirred within their hearts, that their hearts have been strangely warmed by the Holy Spirit and that faith is stirring, a capacity to believe and to receive Christ, to believe upon him, to put their trust in him and to personally receive him is arising within them and I pray, help them now to cross that line and to say yes, even if they don't understand it all, help them to believe. Help them to receive Jesus as their saviour. As we're in this attitude of prayer, nobody looking around. My fellow Christians praying. If that's you and you've never received Jesus as your saviour, will you do it right now in your heart? Just pray this prayer. It's between you and God that he will hear and he's going to rush in. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm knocking on the door of your heart. But he's not going to bash that door down. He says, if you invite me in, if you open the door, take the handle and say, yes, I open up, Jesus, come within me. I want to place my trust in you, Jesus. I don't understand you. But if you're saying, Lord, I believe, you've looked. And like John, you've said, I believe. And joy will come into your heart. Believe that God loves you. Believe that Jesus died for you. Believe that he rose for you. Believe that he sent the Holy Spirit. Believe that your sins can be forgiven. Believe that he can give you the Holy Spirit and the gift of eternal life and power to live as he wants you to live. Just say in your heart now, Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. Save me, Lord. Save me. Forgive me. Heal my soul. I thank you now in Jesus' name.